I went through the same thing when I, I didn't own the gym, but I quit and started my business and it yeah. went from being with people six, six days a week, training with training partners, training my clients yeah. to just being in like literally the local coffee shop <laughs> working. Yeah. And then I made a home office, which I thought was legit, but, uh, man, having this place, I'm so thankful because like some of my team comes in, it's just, it's just different. And having space, we actually had a guy who I went to high school with, he started a, uh, like an equipment company. So it's called giant lifting. They're pretty new and they're local here. I saw that yesterday. Yeah. So they make plates on stuff and they moved in the same building as me, which is like ideal how I like perfect world. Right. So we're yeah. working together to do something cause we want to partner and they came over yesterday and I was like, Hey, I need a squat rack. And he's like, all right, well, I'm going to give you this trap bar and these farmer's bars and these plates and this dip station, all this stuff too. Cause I want you to try it all. Yeah. I was like, dude, it's Christmas. Christmas. <laughs> That's rad. So sick. So, but man, um, I'm already recording cause, uh, I just figured we're going to start running on a tangent. And I want to get it going. So yeah. I, I do want to ask about your history, really like your background and, and how you got lifting in the first yeah. place. But then also, you know, the gym, you just mentioned, like you sold your gym and it was kind of depressing, like take us through that as well, but just give us the, give us the whole story in a nutshell. Yeah. I started training when I was 13. Um, you know, I think that I was kind of, and, and this is still like a very real concept to me in that, uh, the majority of my training has always been about, um, I think a lot of people get into fitness because they're like kind of insecure and want to look better and want to lose body fat. And they're trying to fit in with girls when they're in high school. And I was really just trying to survive. So I left home when I was 14 years old to go play ice hockey in Massachusetts. And I was like a really big, I did this national tournament called hockey night in Boston, which I don't even know if it still exists. And I got stomped like our team for the mid Atlantic was just getting hammered by kids in the Northeast, kids from Minnesota, kids from North Dakota. Uh, and I realized that I was good, but only for people that are bad at playing ice hockey. <laughs> um, so that was the rude awakening. And that was, that actually like set the stage for kind of like the remainder of my life of just, I just want to find out how good I can be at something if I really try. Um, so I went away, I left home at 14 to go play ice hockey at prep school. Um, my options were to move to Minnesota, which is like the best high school hockey in the country. Um, and then I found out about prep school through this tournament called hockey night in Boston, where kids went and lived in dorms at 14, 15 years old and played hockey. It was like, kind of went to college early. Um, it was eight and a half hours away from my parents. So I was really, I was on my own in this like very safe and structured environment. Um, and I was lining up on the ice against kids that had been drafted in the NHL when I was 15 years old. Um, so you can imagine me, I was a ra rather late bloomer, um, and lining up against kids that are six, two that are shaving, they have full beards. <laughs> and I can specifically remember like getting on the ice and just looking at these people and then skating back to the bench and looking at my teammates and going, what the hell am I doing out here with these guys, like I need somebody to take, take my, my, the guys that I'm marking today. Like I need off the ice with this kid. I'm a child compared to him. They're like, Oh yeah, he got drafted last year. He's just back to get, you know, a postgraduate year. In. And I'm like, great. What a, what a great day this is going to be. Um, so lifting weights, like my dad had a really good strength background um, and taught me how to squat and I did a lot of high rep, high volume squatting programs. Um, I did a lot of lunges, uh, a little bit of upper body stuff. But really, it was like I was like the only kid that I knew that it was really doing legs. Um, and that I kind of remained that way for a long time just because legs was like this weird thing that people didn't do back in the day. <laughs> it was like everybody just wanted a big upper body to look jacked. And I didn't really care about that. I just wanted to be stronger and faster on the ice. So I squatted a lot. Um, you know, college hit. Um, I lost a, I, I, I'm 5'8", 190 pounds. I don't even remember what I was when I left high school. But I wasn't big enough to, to go do anything special and, and realize that, you know, I needed to just go to college. Um, got a little sidetracked, I guess, just because kids get sidetracked in college. And then I met Brian. So I'd been training a good seven, eight years, something like that before I met Brian and Brian Borstein, he was the co-owner in the gym. He's been on your show a couple of times. Um, and as soon as I met him, 
I really had this like launch pad of, it was just, I found somebody that was really into this thing that I was into. And he was even further ahead of me and his progress from doing body for life challenge and just being on online forums, which I didn't even really know existed. And he was just really into um, more of the education side, which I was just really into banging weights and getting strong. And once we connected and once we started doing it, it was just on, like I had somebody to basically battle every day of who could be the strongest. Um, and that continued on for a really long time. I and mean, we've been friends for 12 years or so now. Um, and it result, and then CrossFit hit and holy hell, that was a wild decade. Um, CrossFit hit and it just, it, it gave, I was allowed to play sports again. That was the biggest change in my whole life is that I just was allowed to play sports again. I was never going to be the guy that showed up to play softball or kickball and thought that I was like really playing a sport. Those are like drinking dating leagues. They're not yeah. really sports. People are just there to go to happy hour after. And I, I want to play. I want to find out if, we're, if you're good. I want to find out if I'm good. And the only way to do that is to make it real. So when it came to lifting weights and CrossFit showed up, it's like, here's the workout. You post your time. We find out who's good or not. And I just happened to have had a decade of squatting in my life already. My legs were stronger than most people. I was younger than most people. Um, and once again, the pond was small enough at the time that uh, going all in and committing to that sport was really – it was, it was such an obvious decision. Um, I knew that CrossFit was going to grow. Uh, I, I ended up going back to grad school, getting my MBA, and then uh, moved to San Diego with 50 pounds of clothes and a backpack and just walked down the street one day and said, I'm going to open a gym. Leaned over to Brian one night in Vegas. He was my roommate. We had been training together. We had talked training. Um, and then six years later, I sold it. And, uh, I learned, I learned a lot about everything at that time, to be honest with you. It was just, uh, from being best friends with somebody, being in business with your best friend. Um, you know, we both got married in that time. Uh, it's just, that's a wildly complicated and amazing learning experience. When you look back, that's really challenging at the same time. So is that, is that what ultimately led to you guys selling the gym? Um, what, what piece? I mean, I mean the, the end of CrossFit. The challenging? Of oh. You guys being involved in CrossFit or like the, the part of you guys being best friends, which I know exactly. So my best friend works for me. So I know, yeah. I know exactly what you mean. It's, there's definitely like a delicate balance that you have to work on um, constantly. But what ultimately yeah. made you make that decision? Ah, uh, so – you know, first off, before I can even answer this question, everybody has to realize, like, I'm answering this question with four years of distance from it now. Like, at the time, there was a lot of, um, you could, you know, throughout the entire process, um, the egos are involved. It's your first business. I had no, neither of us had really had any experience in, in growing something. And then it was successful, which nobody, including us, really expected at the time. Um, and we had this thing that we're, we're supposed to love. I, the biggest catalyst really for in the end selling it was that we both fell out of love with CrossFit. And it started with rebranding the gym and trying to find our, our, our new purpose. Um, once you stop competing in CrossFit, CrossFit becomes kind of a ridiculous thing to do every day. Um, not that a lot of people don't get in shape and a lot of people don't get stronger and leaner and do things that they never thought they would be able to do. But as far as like a sustainability measure goes, and we had numbers to, to back up almost all of the lack of sustainability and that people come in um, and they either leave in month two or right around the 18 month mark when they find out how good they're actually going to be at the sport then they kind of just go, oh, well, I experienced all this. I saw how far I could go, and what's the point anymore? Um, so we rebranded the gym 
really as just like our, our, our initial move of saying, we're just not CrossFit anymore. We don't know exactly what we are, which was probably the, in hindsight, the piece that we should have had really dialed in to begin with. But once we didn't know exactly what that new training program was and, and all we knew is what we didn't want versus what we did want, um, that really just started kind of the, the slow division of like, I wanted to go one way, Brian wanted to go another way. And we had this like baby that we had created together that was worth a decent amount of money and we needed to get out of it. Um, and that just, look, when you, I mean, you're, you're in business with one of your best friends, right? And I don't even know if you can be in business with somebody that isn't your best friend, to be honest with you. Yeah. Like I better, like even with my partnership with Doug right now, there's like a mutual understanding that the, I'm also responsible for the well-being of his entire family, like all of his kids, all, his wife, um, and he's just as responsible for the health of my family and that we all have to show up every day and, and do our best. Um, so that's when business starts to get really tricky when there's that tug of war of where are we going? What are we doing? You know, we had... Anytime you rebrand something, it takes a while to, it just takes a while to, to get that footing and, and find that exact messaging that really fits with who you are and then finding the people. Um, and we had that, you know, CrossFit just went through that, that entire process, right? With um, Glassman leaving and all the gyms wanted to leave when he made those uh, Floyd 19 comments. And I just, I was like, all these people need to hold on because they don't realize when you say you're a CrossFit gym, people are coming to you because they want to play CrossFit. And then on the second tier, they want you to be their coach in CrossFit. I had it backwards in that I thought people wanted to learn from me and I just happened to be teaching them CrossFit. But that entity of CrossFit is so big and so well known that people go and move to a new town and they say, I want to do CrossFit in whatever town I'm in. And then Google kicks them back a response that says, okay, well, you should go to this place. And then you meet the coaches and then you meet the community. And that's how that, that like process flows. And, and we found out just early on in, in the rebranding that you just don't have that influx of people. You don't have people coming in the door as much when you take CrossFit away uh, and you become Anders and Brian Fitness. We called it San Diego Athletics, which I actually love the name. And I, it really resonates with more of who I think I am and who he is now and what he's doing. Um, but we, we just, we didn't have it 100% right, mainly because it was our first time doing it. And you just don't get things right most of the time on the first try. Yeah. Um, but that was, that was really the big thing is like, we just looked back or we, we looked at what we were doing. We had both gotten out of the competition scene and we just wanted to run the best possible training program for the people that were coming in the door. And it, it, the people coming in the door to CrossFit gyms stopped being high level high school division three division one athletes uh from the early days the like the early adopter athletes that couldn't play anymore and it became very gen pop uh moms and dads people that were just trying to get in shape and they're up there trying to do butterfly kipping pull-ups three weeks into the training program because they see see it on the internet you go you just there's nothing wrong with crossfit there's just pieces of it that we didn't have control over and and that's what we tried to to get after was really controlling the messaging and the programming that we were putting together this might be an exaggerated statement but i even kind of look at it like you know you played ice hockey so it's like oh man i'm gonna get in shape i'm gonna go start playing ice hockey it's like yeah no you would never do that <laughs> that's a right? sport. so crossfit is kind of that way um so i mean i, I see eye to eye with you on that for sure uh yeah but I guess like, and you kind of already alluded to it or answered it, but what was the defining moment where you were like, this is not the path we want to continue taking and, and why is it not the right path or the sustainable path? Like, what were you seeing? Uh, really, it was the, the people that were showing up. There was a general feeling. So when, it, when we started the gym, you knew CrossFit was going to be huge. And I want to say I was inside, like, I always say I was inside the first, like, 
thousand people in the world that were doing it. I mean, I was like 2006. Um, for me to get to a gym in 2006, I had to drive almost 40 minutes. That was as close as it could get. And I almost opened one in 2007 before I went to go back to grad school. And while I was there, I watched the gym that I went to. The gym owner grew his gym from like 30 members when I was there to 300 by the time I graduated a year and a half later. And you just see that growth and you're like, I know this thing's going to be huge. I, I've been, I'm a part of it. I'm addicted to it. I've got this, this thing that's biting me. And the competition was about to gr explode. Reebok hadn't showed up. Um, and we hit at the perfect time to think that we were great trainers too. Like we opened 2010, which is exactly when Reebok signed the deal. So all of our marketing was done for us. All of the business stuff you didn't have to worry about it. Everybody was coming to find out what this new thing was. And we were the only people in town. I think the outside of kind of the, the larger shift of CrossFit itself um, changing was the, our town had roughly 40,000 people in it. And for the first five years, we had no competition outside of the CrossFit gym that didn't call themselves CrossFit down the street, which is totally cool. Um, we battled it out with them. They were awesome. They worked really hard. They had a great product. They just did what it looked like we did, even though, you know. Um, so competition was relatively low, and there was enough people in our, in our town to really keep business moving. When, when I sold it, we had three CrossFit gyms inside our town for 40,000 people. So you think about how many people don't know what CrossFit is in 2016. It's like nobody, everybody knows what it is. They've all tried it. So you're not really bringing anything new and you lose control of that education piece in the sales process. Um, you also are, you get into this like weird price war and we were the most expensive gym by a lot which we enjoyed for a very long time. And we, I thought we provided a very, very high level of value to go along with it and the coaching. And like we, we had multiple coaches on the floor at all times. Um, I thought we, we, had a, we had a great product and a great business. Um, it's just the stuff that you can't control starts to beat you down when there's a gym that opens a block down the street, when there's another one that opens a mile down the street. And you just, it just, it's like disheartening. And you realize, okay, well, we have a new mountain to climb. Do you really want to go and climb this mountain that you've been climbing for the last six years? Or is it time to just find a, find a new, map, new mountain and, and go that way? And that's kind of really, really was the end when all the gyms started opening. And, and we just realized we're ready, to, we're ready to be different again because CrossFit became so, such a commodity. And after that, and you sold and everything, at what point did Barbell Shrug enter the picture? Because I know all this was pre-Shrugged, right? Yeah. Um, so I started an, another online, so, so cliche, right? You go from brick and mortar performance facility to named CrossFit Pacific Beach to I'm broken and I need to learn how to use strength and conditioning to like rehab my body. Um, and as I was just, dealing, just getting healthy again, like the, the year and a half, two year long kind of process of leaving competition and trying to figure out a long-term plan um, to like nagging shoulders and ankles and just all the junkiness that you fight through every day. Um, all of my personal training clients started having like, it's kind of like that vibe you put out into the world. It's like, I'm injured. I'm fixing myself. I'd like to learn more about fixing myself. And then all the personal training clients you get for the next six months all have like back injuries or shoulder injuries and ankle injuries and they're fighting through something and you just get good at fixing problems. Um, so I, I started a rehab company online with a physical therapist uh, where she did all called Movement RX. Um, in which she did all the PT stuff and I did all the strength and movement. Um, and along the way, I just 
I needed mentors in the really in the like online digital space. I didn't understand it. I didn't understand marketing funnels. I didn't understand email marketing, just everything that really makes online businesses roll. Um, so the guys had a, a breakfast that they used to run about 20 minutes away from maybe 30 minutes away from where I was working uh, or where my office was. And I realized that 30 minutes was way too far away for me to be commuting on a weekly basis to go eat breakfast with people and not get anything done, which is what most of those breakfasts are for people. Uh, so I went to the very first one and I just kind of made a commitment to myself. I was like, this is the only one I'm going to. I'm going to figure out a way to become friends with these people on day one and get them in the gym. And when we start training together, then they'll just be my best friends and I'll be able to learn everything for free. Because I, this is, this is part of the, this is like, it's, my, it's how I do everything. It's how I date people or date girls. When I was single, you just go to the gym and I'm the most fun person. So I have to, you would want to hang out with me. It just made sense. <laughs> Um, that's how I meet business connections. That's how I do everything. It's like, let's just go train. It's going to be awesome. You'll obviously want to teach me everything you know after we work out together. Um, so that's really exactly what happened. Uh, we started training together. Then I became friends. Mike and I became friends. And immediately I knew that there was something was kind of up and that Mike was veering one direction. They were going through a very similar thing that Brian and I were going through at the time. Um, and one day Doug texted me, asked if I wanted to co-host. So I got like a 12 episode kind of jump in, I guess, to Barbell Shrug to going from zero people listening to my voice to many, many, many thousands. And, um, towards the end of that, I looked at Doug and Mike and just kind of kicked it to them of like, Hey, I really like this. I know things are going on. Why don't you bring me onto the team? And Mike took a new show uh, called the Bledsoe show that he runs um, and went his own direction. And then I took over Barbell Shrugged and became an owner. And now, here we are. I love it. But dude. It was always because the gym. Yeah. I just love being in the gym. That's, that's really how all this stuff happens. Um, so I just, want to be in the gym training with people and that's my that's my sweet spot that's where i have the most fun and i just in all honesty i just really believe that if i can get people in the gym more and and make them love training as much as me then it'll all work out i, I truly believe that some of the best benefits of training are completely unrelated to how like in shape you are you know like training in the gym itself gives you so yeah. much and teaches you so much in life period um, and it's the same with me. I've, I've had girlfriends that I met at the gym. I've had best friends, business yeah. partners, like so many different people that I've met at the gym, mentors. Um, one thing I do want to ask you is because I'm assuming you, you kind of have to know the history of Barbell Shrug prior to you getting on. So I'm assuming you can answer this pretty well too. But Barbell Shrug seems to have kind of, because I've been listening to, to this show for yeah. a long time. I remember when you made the transition. Yeah they have made somewhat of a shift away from CrossFit. At first it was very CrossFit dominant and it's like kind of slowly shifted away, but there's still that element of, I wouldn't even say CrossFit, like more like functional fitness, like that style of training. So my question yeah. is what was that transition like for the, the podcast and what is it that you guys promote or do now? Like how do you program? What is the way you like to train now? Because you know, you guys even have one, uh, a program called uh, Imam Aesthetics, I believe. Imams yeah. were like designed by CrossFitters. Like that's where that yeah. came out, but it doesn't need to be used with snatches and muscle ups. <laughs> you know, you can do no. it another way and you kind of blend that feel that people want without breaking them down, which I love so much. I think it's really smart, but kind of explain that transition and, and how you guys do things now, what you guys represent now. Yeah. I'm super happy one that you've even picked up on that. Um, it's been, that's a big transition. Uh, I think that the best way to answer that really is just finding what's true and authentic to Doug and I and writing that program. Um, people, 
many times people get really scared of the evolution of their life and finding a training program that actually suits them for what they truly need. Like there's no, we all know somebody that is 10 pounds overweight and they haven't really done that much. They've let themselves go a little bit. And the very next thing they do is they go find their favorite influencer with a gigantic six pack and they go start doing that five day a week, full body routine. And ha they have no idea that they're about to spend 90 minutes in the gym. They need to be eating a gigantic number of calories. And then two weeks later they're burnt out and they've failed. So, so I would never do that program. I can't do that program. Like, I have a business to run. I've got a family. Um, I've got like a yard to cut. Like I have responsibilities. And for the first time in all of our lives, when I say all of our lives, it's me, Doug and Travis. Um, training is it's so weird to say, but like training is in a way, it's like the fourth most important thing in my life. Even and it's the first time and that process didn't change from like, oh, it's number one because I'm an athlete. And then now it's number two because I'm married. And now it's number three. No, it went from one to four. There was no slow, gradual thing. Like even when I got married, if I needed to go train, I was going to go train because I'm just married. It's like my girlfriend with more legal documents. And I'm not really letting her down. She's going to go do whatever she wants to do. So training always takes this precedent. But then I became a dad and that totally rocked my world because now if I say no to going to the park or riding skateboards or doing whatever that is, now I'm missing out on legit dad time. And like, I can't let business go to the wayside. So business is important. And because of the responsibilities to being a, a dad, it's like, I, I want to be there more as a husband because now my husband time has been taken by dad time. So now I have to prioritize being a husband even higher than it ever was before. So it's like, I need to be a dad every day and I need to be a husband every day and I need to run a really good business. And I've been training for 23 years. Do you think if I miss a workout, anything bad is going to happen? No. Like I could take a month off and I'd still be just as strong as almost I ever was. So training's like fourth and that's a long ways away from number one. So when I look at what do I really need, Imam Aesthetics became the most obvious choice, especially when quarantine hit because I was being all four of those things all in the same time, like going from dad to daycare to, and, and it's just all in the house. And my mom was living with us and it just, it was chaos. So how do you, how do you hit all of your fitness goals or how do you hit 95% of your fitness goals when you have like this tiny little window to be able to go work out during the day? It's like, well, why don't we throw like a 20 minute EMOM together? We'll make sure we lift something heavy. We'll make sure we get all of our accessory work in. And we'll just combine it into two 10-minute EMOMs and we'll run the EMOMs as if they're supersets with each other. So you're doing these little micro supersets of 10-minute EMOM, but then you can go a push and a pull and you get, for people that have been training or for people that are short on time, you can create this training effect where is it optimal to rest three minutes in between sets? Absolutely. Like for sure. You should definitely recover. You should definitely have if you have that kind of time to go spend 60 to 90 minutes in the gym, you should take two, three, maybe four minutes, depending upon who you are in between sets to have maximal strength going into the next set. Absolutely. Does everybody have 60, 90 minutes to be waiting around in the gym to recover? No, they're busy ass people like I am. And Imam Aesthetics just happened. Doug was doing it on his own and I was doing it on my own, a little bit different. And we just started talking about it and was like, we can take hypertrophy principles, we can put them into these cool little imams and then set it up so that we get it done in 20 to 30 minutes. And it's been our best selling program of the year, which is awesome. I'm a dad. I don't know what else to do. <laughs> like my whole world 
is totally rocked by this thing. And now training's fourth for the first time ever. So I have to go and meet my life where it's at because I'm not giving up working out. But I have to also understand who I am and what's the most important. And being a dad, being a husband, running a badass business, and uh, at fourth is training. I love that, man. The, the principle behind that of, of really just, and I try to tell this to people all the time, like stress is stress, right? So whether yeah. it's good stress or bad stress or it's training stress or work stress or family stress or relationship stress, it's stress and your body's going to get worn down from it. I know for me, I, I was kind of in denial when I first had my daughter and I was I just started our, the business like a year, a year and a half before. So it's like in the biggest yeah. growth phase, just had a daughter and was getting barely any sleep at all. And I decided to run this program uh, that I had originally done, I mean, years ago. And it was basically, you had like a, a heavy squat, a heavy press, a heavy high pull, and then like a, a weighted chin up, just like really big compound lifts. And you basically, you're working in the one to five rep range in a circuit five days a week. just brutal. And it was the first time I had depression. Like I literally (laughs) just burnt out to the point where I was literally depressed. And I was like, what am I doing? And it was just, it was purely just trying to train. Like I was training when I was 20 while I just had a daughter and it was such a bad mix, man. But it's just that same thing. It's, it's stress. You know what I mean? And, And if you can't control that, good luck. Yeah. The, uh, the other piece that I've also, you know, through, because of Barbell Shrugged, I've had this ridiculous opportunity to meet so many cool people. Mm-hmm. And um, you just get exposed to different stuff. So, like, I've been to Laird Hamilton's house a couple times, um, doing the underwater training, the sauna wow. training, the ice training. Um, the breath work training. I've been able to go and hang out with some like wildly out there breath work, psychedelic weird shit that goes on. <laughs> and it's all because of lifting weights. Like lifting weights is, it is the core. It's the center of all of it. But when you start to kind of expand what that is, and all of us want to have this large capacity of experiences to draw from and experience new things and learn something else. Like how many more deadlifts can I do? So what if I can get all my deadlifts and all my back training and all my leg training done? And maybe I'm not getting a hundred percent of the hypertrophy I could get if I had a 90 minute session doing everything perfect. What if I get like 95% of that, but also I get to go to the pool down the street and I get to go do like breath hold training and swimming at the same time. And what if I take that 20 minute EMOM and then immediately go in the sauna and see how long I can sit in there at 150 degrees in the middle of the summer. And that's the stuff that I get really stoked on. And if I spent all that time in the gym, all those like hours, it would be really hard to, to get all the things in that I, I enjoy doing and, and, kind of that like breadth of experience of just sampling fitness probably isn't the word, but sampling like my human capacity, my physical capacity to just do new things. One of the questions I had for you, I think this is going to be a perfect segue for it is what does fitness mean to you? I was going to wait till the end, but I think I want to ask now because you're kind of yeah. diving down that path. Like what is fitness to you now? Like once upon a time, it was obviously athletic performance, right? Competition. Yeah but things have changed. What, what is like, if you had to define it for somebody, what does it mean? Uh, well, for somebody else, um, I really view fitness in kind of four, four components. And I'm very much, I've, I've followed this path. I think many people follow this path, uh, but we all kind of get into it in the physical and that physical side is I want to get stronger. I want to get leaner. I'd like to get more athletic. Those are kind of like the three big goals for, for strength, strength athletes. And then you hit the roadblock and the basic stuff doesn't work anymore. And the problem typically isn't the physical capacity. It's the fact that your brain won't allow you to get stronger, or you have these stories in your head that you have to get through in order to be able to truly realize how physically strong you can be. 
like the self-limiting beliefs. And then the, that mental side of things really butts up against a bunch of emotional things. So you go from the physical into the mental, and then you start to dig into a lot of the emotional side of training. And how bad do you really want to be good? How bad do you really want to find out how good you could be if you fully committed to this thing and, and truly just lived the life and, and really went all in. Um, and not many people want to go to that place. Um, and once you get through the emotional side of things, you start to come out of that into the real woo woo thing of the spiritual side of training and connecting with your body and really fitness to me is this it's like a systems check i feel like i'm able to go in my body and and find out what's working i'm i'm able to see how strong i am how well i move um how i can continue to learn something new about myself and and all of it and that's the journey that i want everybody to go on and the way that that looks to me is exactly what i was just saying of well, I'm not going to learn a ton about like Olympic lifting anymore or deadlifting anymore or squatting anymore, but really simply like how do I change squatting so that it's something new or how do I take a deadlift and, and everybody can go do this. It's just as simple as doing your standard deadlift, but closing your eyes and getting out of your head and getting into your body and you just start to recognize really different patterns and different feelings and the physical capacity on when you work yourself back up that chain is the idea of physical freedom and that and this this is what i chase in my in my whole existence really now is the physical freedom to like when someone wants to go play cool let's do it um, I was down in Jamaica and I ran a 60 meter dash against Johan Blake. Let's go. You're the fastest man in the world, but I trust my body. Let's go. John Cena wants to show up and snatch and clean and jerk. Let's go. Um, I'll be strong. I'm not worried about that. Like, let's go play. Um, I got challenged when I was down in Jamaica, somebody challenged me to an open water swim and, uh, that was a mile long. Cool. Let's go. Like, I, I just don't ever want to be hindered by my physical capacity. And many people, when they, they get in that situation, will back down or they will say, ah, oh, it's dangerous. I never want to say that. Um, I always want to be able to trust my body. I always want to be able to get out into the ocean, um, whether it's surfing big waves, big waves for me, not Laird Hamilton, big waves. Um, I want to be able to jump in an ice bath. I want to be able to sit in that sauna with him at 220 degrees and play that man game where we're just having a conversation, acting like I'm not cooking on the inside. But like, I want to be able to do those things um, and always trust myself and always be able to play the game and feel very, very confident in myself. Um, which is so far away from why people get into fitness to lose weight and get stronger. Um, which is why I think you have to go through kind of all four of those levels before you can truly start to express um, physical freedom, which is to me the, the end goal. When I think that only comes from years and years and years of training, you know, and, and even, and this is another question I want to ask you is like the people you've met and the people you've interviewed and things you've learned just from your career as a podcaster, which by the way is really fucking cool that we can say like, what do you do for a living? I podcast. Yeah. <laughs> like that's bad. Right? Um, so what, I don't know if you can even answer this, the best interviews you've ever done, but like what yeah. are the most impactful interviews you've ever done and the impactful people you've met through podcasting and some of those lessons, like the biggest things you've taken away, like a handful of things that you just, that, that really impacted you and changed the way you approach fitness, approach business, approach life because of the podcast. Um, so the biggest one isn't from podcasting is actually from training with, Cena for four years, um, which we can totally talk about, but I'll, and more specific to the podcast, I think the ones that are um, 
the most impactful to me are the people that I've looked up to for so long. And then all of a sudden I'm just in the room with them one day. And assuming that when I was a, a kid reading their book or Boyle's like the perfect example, I've been in so many forum debates with Mike Boyle that I lost only because I didn't understand what he was saying because I wasn't mature enough at the time or I wasn't seasoned enough as a coach, which is super humbling to look back on yourself and go, oh, I just, I just hadn't gotten that far in the journey. But he's right. If you go long enough and you do it long enough, we all kind of land on boil, like, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, so sitting in that room with him and, and rapping with him for two hours was incredible. One of my favorite parts of that interview, I know you have this, you work in strength conditioning. You also play and have fun in strength conditioning. You also sometimes say I'm going to the gym to work, but you also know that you're going to go play and you're going to go have fun. So like when you're late at work and your wife calls and she's like, Hey, when are you going to be home? And you're like, Oh, I'm probably going to be like another hour, but then it's like an hour and a half. And then maybe two hours, you know, you're late. You feel really guilty about it. So I'm, I'm interviewing Boyle and our, our conversation is just crushing. Like he's just smashing and I'm getting all the questions answered that I've ever wanted to ask him in person. And his phone keeps going off and he's to my wife. I'm supposed to be home. I kind of feel guilty about staying here, but I really want to stay. And I was like, dude, I have that all the time too. I know I should be going home, but I just want to stay at the gym all the time. Um, but he had some, he had some really awesome wisdom. Um, ben Bergeron, somebody that I've looked up to um, and just Ben Bergeron as a business owner is somebody that I really respect his, uh, his brain and what he's built at CrossFit New England, um, how he's built comp train and really somebody that just does the right thing so consistently that you just, you almost expect him one day to have a blunder, but he just consistently does the right thing over and over and over again. And that's really hard to do. Um, Joe Miller, somebody that I'm, I probably, I, I learned a ton from and was really excited to talk to her about fascia just because it's something I don't understand. Um, I, I think you just pick up these little things from people um, along the way that it's not even the information so much. It's just how those people, the feeling that they put off when you meet them, there's just such a positive, good vibe about people that are at the top of the game. And um, it's, it's just like, how are they being in the room? How do they make people feel? How do they, um, how do they articulate so well the point that they're trying to make? Um, Cause you can read all the information in the book, but you can't feel that person's energy until you're sitting there with them and, and seeing how they just influence the conversation and the expertise and um, maturity and just like professionalism that they bring to the, the conversation. I love that, man. I would love to sit down with Michael Boyle, especially, but go out there. I know I need to, well, and it's when you to walk into his gym, this is, this is, so I met, we did the show like at the perfect time. Like my wife was just getting ready to have a baby. Uh, it was one of our last trips before we, we traveled. And then so I just, he, he just looked like he, I walked into his gym and there was like 500 kids under 14 years old sprinting, doing goblet squats, rear foot elevated split squats. <laughs> and they all had a coach. They were all foam rolling. And it was like, I, I had no idea. I was so blown away by the program that he runs there that I didn't even have to meet him. But by the time we got in the room, I was just like, whoa, this is the guy. There's a reason he's Mike Boyle. When it's Savage. Funny, yeah, and in, in, when I was in college, I really had no idea who my professor or teacher was. And he started bringing his like friends and colleagues to do like presentations, like yeah. Zoom calls and stuff. And it was Michael Boyle, Gray Cook, Dan John, um, Charlie Weingroff, all these people that at the time I was like, oh, cool. And then I started like, I'd Google them afterwards and I started realizing, holy shit, these people are like 
they're the shit. Yeah. Like these are the people, you know? So, um, Eric Cressy, a bunch of people. So it, it was really cool. And, and realistically I could probably make those connections and, and go that route. I need to get my teacher on this podcast actually, but, um, man, I got, I got a, a couple more questions for you, uh, before we part ways. And one of them is, uh, about fatherhood and we've kind of touched yeah. on a couple times, but you're always talking about being a diesel dad. So first and foremost, right? what is a diesel dad? <laughs> um, yo, that's like my little superhero character. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm in my garage right now. And if everybody could imagine me looking out to the right out of my garage, where I live, the, whoever designed this neighborhood, there's exactly a one mile trail around the not trail, but a uh, one mile lap around. So I can take off from my house, go sprint, run a mile and be back in here. And that's like a fun little thing that I do a couple times a day just to, just to move. And uh, it's exactly a mile, but I'm not the only one that does this. And people are all constantly walking this track around my neighborhood. Um, and sometimes I'm in here just like by myself, just dying under front squats. And I see them, I'll like look over and they're, they're like, what the hell is that guy doing? And I realized it's nice to identify with something because it, it allows you to really set your training goals. It allows you to be real with yourself. And my whole life I've been either a hockey player or a strength athlete or a coach. And this new stage, I kind of – it's not like I was really in denial, but I totally understand that of like, I still carried with me the fact that I needed to like be able to snatch 225 and I still need to be able to clean and jerk 300 whenever I wanted. And all these numbers that were from my past that I just always assumed that I could do. And when I, when I really started to do kind of that, like soul searching and objectively viewing who I am and what I was going through in this new evolution of me um you know i have this barbell shrug lots of people listen to me talk um we've we've all got social media which is really loud and i don't know if i fit into any of those like influencer categories i don't really consider myself to be that influential um i really just feel like i fit into this like I'm just a dad. Like I, I wake up and I do dad stuff. I, I change diapers. I try to put hair bows in. Um, and that's where I'm like the most in my happy place during those times. I just also happen to be the guy when my neighbor's walking through that might clean 300 pounds and slam a barbell when you walk by. And it might scare you a little bit just because when I lift weights, it's different. Um, and that's really where that came from. And then quarantine hit and I had quarantine got crazy because I had to start training at 530 in the morning. And because we, we were recording at 630 a.m. every day. So the last thing you want to do is wake up at 615, roll to your computer and then have to go speak intelligently about strength and conditioning when the only th and your very first word is now being recorded. Um, so I started waking up and I just created a fun little morning routine called, which I just coined the diesel dad 100, which I go and whatever, if there's 135 pounds on the bar, I'll just go do 50 RDLs in the morning. I'll do 50 pull-ups and broken up into a bunch of sets. Um, but I just try and accumulate a hundred reps of two exercises um, just to, get things moving. Um, and just to make me smarter in the morning, to be honest with you, like I enjoy training. It centers me. It's, it is the, the, the dead center of everything to me. It's, it's why everything else in my life exists. Um, without a barbell, I wouldn't have my wife. I wouldn't have had a gym. I wouldn't have stories to tell. I wouldn't have this conversation. I wouldn't have the people and the network that I've created. Um, it's all because of lifting weights. So if the very first thing that I get to do every single day is lift weights, I'm checking that box and the rest of the day will work out exactly like it's supposed to, just like it has for the last 23 years. And um, 
that's why it's my little superhero because I get to be up before everybody else. Nobody else can touch it. Uh, if they wanted to touch that time, they'd have to work really hard and be very uncomfortable to really come after me at five thirty in the morning. And um, it's just it's my time. And and then I go for a little walk and. Um, the real trippy part is when I, I try and say what's up to the trees and, and be barefoot because being a part of nature is important too. Um, but that's, that's really where it came from was just me really just committing to the, the next evolution of, of life. And, and what's important to me is uh, it's, it's no longer about how much weight can I lift. It's just about keeping that most central piece and most central element to my life um, still the most important. And the only way that I can really control that is getting up, getting out of bed, and making it happen. I love it, man. I think it's so important. Uh, even it, it sounds weird to some people, especially if you're not a dad, but like, or a mother, but being fit makes you such a better parent in a way. Right. And, yeah. and you're just a better person and you know how to lead better. You know how to push into adversity and resistance better. And I, I posted something and you commented hashtag diesel dad. And it, I was like, fuck yeah. Like it was yeah, badass, right? but good. And, and it's, and it's funny because when I think about it, it really is just like leveling up as a dad is what is what I took it as is like being the most of yourself so that you can be the most for them. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think being an entrepreneur by itself is really challenging. Being a strength athlete by itself is really challenging. Putting all that stuff together, um, you're going to take your lumps along the way. You're going to get kicked. It's going to be hard. And the first place most of us learn that lesson is grinding out back squats. And if you want to get, get after it, no one's going to pick the bar up for you. You just got to go. And I don't really enjoy like these big symbolism things about lifting weights in life and all that stuff. It's just you know, you develop some grit, you develop some character under the bar. And um, I also think that it's really important. I think about it a lot. I have a girl. Do you have a girl, boy? Yeah, a girl, a little girl. Yeah. And I want her to know that uh, it's expected to be tough. She's expected to be tough. Being gritty is a, a very important characteristic. And um, I, I feel like I, I like to treat her that way. Like we go train she's two i take her to the soccer field we have to go run she gets pushed around i bump into her knock her over probably sounds like child abuse but <laughs> um yeah I, I think all just all that stuff it comes from the the weight room and that's it's it's an essential piece of who i am and this core piece of my life that she will just grow up around and consider that to be normal. And one day she'll learn that not everybody has that. And that will be her superpower. I love that dude. I, I, and I agree completely. And I read this quote a while back that kind of shifted how I was looking at myself, but it was something along the lines of, uh, you have to be the standard of what your daughter will think a man is right. Yeah. Eventually. And that just made me think of every action I take, every word I say, the way I do fitness, everything, my business, yeah. like literally everything. Um, do you think that the awareness of all these things you're, you're like hitting on that fitness has given you over this whole podcast, do you think just the awareness of that is what allows you to keep staying motivated? Because I mean, 23 years into training, I think you said, and you're still waking up, ass crack of dawn and lifting heavy weights every morning. Yeah. What do you think it's just knowing all these little things and actually being in tune with what it does for you on a psychological and physiological level that allows you to just keep grinding away? Cause you just know. Um, yeah, I, 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 it's really like a gratitude thing and that I really am just happy that I get to do it. Um, and the fact that, I do the same thing today that I did when I was 13. Like I'm really just an older kid <laughs> with a lot. There's a lot more riding on it and that we've got to feed our families and we've got to, we've got to do the work and you need to be good at it. You need to stay on the education side. And there's a lot of, there's a lot more upkeep to, to maintaining uh, the lifestyle. But um, 
I lift weights. And if I stop lifting weights, everything else crumbles. Nothing, nothing will stay here. So I'm insanely grateful that I get to wake up every morning, go downstairs in the dark, turn the light on and lift weights. It's, it's really uh, that simple. And because of it, because of lifting weights, I've faced adversity. I've been able to open businesses. I've had best friends. I've lost best friends. I've regained best friends. Um, and I've met incredible people. Like it's the access point to everything. And, you know, most people probably don't understand what that means. Like if I want to be your friend and I want to do business with you, you know, this is like a, maybe to, to almost sum it all up when we, I have a hard time making friends. Like I just I'm relatively uninterested in most other people's lives, mainly because they don't lift weights and they don't own businesses. And even if they do, they tell me about their exercise program and I go, please don't make me do this. Um, and it's because for some reason, I have to go slay those two dragons every day. And if I don't go slay those two dragons of growing a bigger business or a better business um, and training and lifting weights, if I don't go do those things, there's something about my soul that is just missing. And those are the, it's not that other people don't have dragons to slay. I just happen to only really want to be slaying those two dragons. And when, you know, my wife goes out and meets friends, she's like, do you think you'll like their husband? And I'm like, probably not, but I'll hang out. She's like, well, why don't I'm like, cause they, I'm not going to be in business with them. I don't want to train with them. And those are the things that I like to do. So I, let's just go and have a good night, but don't expect me to be best friends by the end of the night. Um, it sounds awful, but I just found my thing. And those are the things that I like. I, I, and those are the things that I want to practice. Those are the things that I want to get better at. And I really just don't have a lot of interest in other things. It, it sounds kind of extremist, but, and I say that because I'm the same exact way, 100% to the core. But I think that's why what makes us successful and able to continually pursue. And even like if we fail at something, keep pushing through and do it again and yeah. do it better and, and win next time because we just know with such like clarity, you know, and, and sometimes it's hard yeah. for me to explain when people ask me, like, how have you been doing it for so long and still motivated? Sometimes like, I, I don't even know how to explain it. I just, I yeah. just do. Don't you want to know how good you could be at something? Yeah. hundred percent. Like what if you, like what, think about like just the first two years of your business. You're like, oh my God, it worked. <laughs> Holy, I'm not broke. Holy crap. Well, what if, what if I did this for 20 years? What could I do? You know, took me 20 years. It took me 14 years to, of training to be confident enough to go train with Cena. It took me 20 years to be able to step onto the mic and become an owner at Barbell Shrugs and have like the audience and the voice and all that fun stuff that we do. Like, what if I go for another 20? What could happen? Like, that would be wild. Well, you're going to have to put the work in to find out how far you can take it. Yeah. That matters. People should push themselves that hard. They should find out. If you really care about something, find out, find out if you could be good at it. Find out if you can make money at it. Find out if, it, if you really want it to be your life or would you just like to not have that pressure on you? And I always say regret is worse than failure. Right. So if you, if you don't do it, you're just going to live with regret, but if you fail, fuck it, you learn a lesson. Maybe you try it again. Maybe you realize it sucked and it wasn't the right thing and <laughs> you do something else, yeah. but at least you don't regret, you know? Not yeah. So I love that, man. It's so good. Uh, I'm going to let you get going. Cause I don't want to take up too much of your time, man, but I want you to tell everybody where to find you. Uh, obviously your guys' podcast, where all your stuff is for Barbell Shrugged, your yeah. personal IG, all that. Um, I'm Anders Varner at Anders Varner, Barbell Shrugged at Barbell underscore Shrugged on Instagram uh, barbellshrug.com. If you want to check out the Imam Aesthetics program, because you're busy, and you just want to get jacked, lift some weights. Um, it's all in there. Love it, man. Thank you for your time, dude. I appreciate it. And, uh, I really enjoyed this one. Yeah, man. I appreciate it, dude.